how can Goofy and Pluto both be dogs? Hello? Oh, hey, Mitt! For some reason, these two iconic Disney dogs can exist side by side in movies and TV, and we don't seem to mind at all. So why is that? This strange paradox of Pluto the pet and Goofy the humanoid actually reflects a deep conflict in how we perceive dogs. To see what I mean, let's go on a trip. It's hard to talk about dogs in movies because there are just so many examples. There's dog companions, talking dogs, and dogs playing basketball. Dogs are so universal in our movies that even other animals tend to act just like them. You're such a good boy! Yes, you are! For the vast majority of dogs in movies, they fit into some form of the Pluto archetype, the idealistic, selfless, loyal best friend. In fact, many dogs in movies are almost supernatural in their ability to sense danger, as if they are innately skilled at protecting us. Many dogs go one step further than the intensely loyal companion and adopt distinctly human characteristics. Shorts like the Hardly Boys in Hardly Gold give dogs the ability to drive cars and solve mysteries. And that's nothing new. Since silent movies, we found something charming about anthropomorphizing dogs, as if we're finally seeing them as we imagine them. Here we see early versions of Goofy, the daft and bumbling sidekick who walks on two legs and has has his own house. So the simple answer to the Pluto-Goofy paradox is that Pluto and Goofy can both exist because they occupy separate but familiar dog archetypes. But that doesn't quite do it for me. What especially bothers me is how Goofy doesn't get the same human-like status as characters like Mickey and Donald. He's almost subhuman, not too bright, clumsy, and doesn't get a love interest in the main cast. Which also brings up another popular online debate. Is it better to be a Goofy or a Pluto? Wouldn't it be nice to be a lazy, pampered house dog? Or maybe that's actually worse. And is it fair that Pluto has to sleep in a doghouse and wear a leash while Goofy, who is also a dog, gets to drive around in a car and play golf with Mickey? Unlike a mouse like Mickey or a duck like Donald, dogs like Pluto and Goofy raise more complicated questions. To see what I mean, we have to go beyond Pluto and Goofy and look at their complete opposite. Let me see your squishy face. <laughs> Many movies remind us that dogs originate from the wild and have a violent side. When it's a small dog, it's usually played for laughs. But movies like Cujo have a wild dog who goes as far as murder. And it seems that any dog can go either way. In the Sandlot, the scary beast behind the fence ends up a harmless dog. And even Santa's little helper, the quintessential family dog, becomes temporarily evil at the flip of a switch. We see this transformation most famously in the story Old Yeller, where Travis has to put down his own dog after the dog gets rabies. The story sounds like an older version of a movie like Marley and Me, a universal tale of dog love and loss. But the movie is also a cautionary tale. Travis first meets Old Yeller in the wild, and it's in that same wilderness where Old Yeller gets rabies, a disease that literally transforms domesticated dogs into untamed beasts. If the story was a simple tale of love and loss, then Travis wouldn't have insisted on shooting the dog himself. The story is about love and loss, but it's also a coming-of-age story, where Travis learns about the dangers of the wild, that at their core, dogs come from the wild, and they can return to those roots. The fear of the wild dog explains cinema's fascination with the coming home narrative, the classic story where a dog gets separated from their family and must find their way home. In these stories, the dog gets pitted against a hostile wilderness, and their inevitable return reaffirms their destined domesticity and validates the sanctity of the traditional American home. This genre seems to exist almost to justify our relationship with dogs, making it clear that dogs do not belong free in the wild where they originated, but rather prefer their lives as our loyal pets. So it's no surprise at all that Pluto, the quintessential dog, has his own coming home adventure in Mickey Mouse, Mickey's Dog Gone Christmas, where he feels destined to return to Mickey's side. So within our portrayals of dogs lies a subtle anxiety. Movies remind us of the wild origins of dogs, yet they also justify their role in our homes. And this uneasy balance exposes the most important idea when it comes to the Pluto-Goofy paradox. We're not really talking about dogs, we're really talking about us. The movie Fruitvale Station chronicles the final day of the real-life Oscar Grant III, a 22-year-old who was shot and killed by Bart Police in 2009. For the most part, the film stays true to what Oscar actually did that day, like going to the store to buy crabs and telling his girlfriend he lost his job. The biggest Creative Liberty writer-director Ryan Coogler took was when Oscar witnessed a pit bull get hit by a runaway driver. And here, we see the implications of the perception of dogs as wild animals. In an interview, Coogler explains why he added the scene. In many ways, pit bulls are like young African-American males. Whenever you see us in the news, it's for getting shot and killed or shooting and killing somebody. 
for being a stereotype. Pit bulls are often perceived as more violent and untamed than the average canine, and many countries around the world restrict pit bull ownership in part for that reason. But a lot of this perception is based in mythology. Many studies suggest that pit bulls are not inherently more violent, but rather are more likely to be victims of abusive environments that lead to inevitable behavioral problems. So by including this moment, Kugler forces the viewer to see Oscar not just through his last day, but also through a broader historical context. Like a pit bull, Oscar is bound up in negative stereotypes that have permeated our media for decades, and those stereotypes play a role in justifying discrimination or even harm against them. Fruitvale Station shows that our portrayal of certain dogs as wild has real-world human consequences, and we can learn a lot about our relationships with each other through our relationships with dogs. Perhaps my favorite example of a dog explaining a human relationship is in the movie Roma. Roma follows the life of an indigenous maid working for an upper-middle-class family in Mexico City. Similar to movies like Parasite, Roma has a more nuanced portrayal of the wealthy. The family genuinely loves Cleo, to the point that they take her to the hospital when she's pregnant and bring her along on their family vacations. Throughout the film, we get subtle connections between Cleo and dogs. The very first scene shows Cleo cleaning up after the family dog, and like the dog, she lives just outside of the actual home, in a separate enclosure near the garage. She also must take orders, most notably when Marina yells at her to leave the house, and when she literally instructs Cleo to sit. At first glance, it sounds nothing but demeaning to associate Cleo with a dog, but it's more complicated than that. After all, all, Cleo is treated very well by the family, and she has a comfortable life compared to other indigenous people in the film. Yet the comparison makes sense because the family does limit her agency like they do with their own dog. Marina does invite Cleo on vacation, but Cleo inevitably ends up doing chores when she's there. And at the hospital, Cleo hardly gets to speak. The doctor talks past her as she relays key information to Marina, her employer. In the same breath, the kids can praise Cleo for saving their lives at the beach and ask her to make them a smoothie. Roma reveals the complications of the human-dog relationship. Is it really better to be a Pluto? It might be, so long as you're okay with not having much say and being told what to do. And in a way, Oscar and Cleo share characteristics with Goofy. They're human, but they're still perceived as a sort of sidekick, a not-quite-fully-respected person in the shadow of the default main cast. According to Disney, Goofy was created as a human character, as opposed to Pluto, who was a pet. For decades, we've been comfortable seeing these two characters side by side, because they fit neatly into our cultural understanding of dogs. Dogs as loyal, idealistic companions, and dogs as anthropomorphic but unintelligent sidekicks. And these stereotypes come from thousands of years of domesticating and loving our dogs, so it's no surprise that dogs have become such powerful symbols, powerful enough even to symbolize the complicated and unequal power dynamics between us humans. So the way we treat animals in our media and in real life matters, because the methods we use to justify animal stereotyping and cruelty often become the same strategies we use to stereotype and dehumanize each other. So the next time you watch a movie, consider all the different ways a dog can go. I like this one. The dog, one dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. One well, is going east and the other one is going west. So what? Thanks to everybody for watching, and thanks especially to my Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this without you.